The bodies of both Brad and Dalen were buried within 30 yards of their family home. Up until then, Zach had increasing contact with Cochise County Juvenile Courts for things such as trespassing on school grounds after being suspended and running away from home. Friends of Zach would recall normal parents that seemingly engaged in normal discipline and guidance. Along with the shotgun, investigators found his parents' wallet and purse, their cash and identification, and bank cards as well. They also found a one-pound brick of marijuana, all in Zach's bedroom. The murder weapon had usually been kept locked in his parents' room. When Joshua and their cousin Michelle got home from school on that Monday, Zach said he simply told them that he didn't know where their parents were. Upon learning of the murders, they were understandably in total shock. The Eggers' older son, Bradley Jr., took over their care. The day after the murders, Zach and a friend drove the Eggers' truck into Agua Prieta, Mexico, actually selling it for $1,000 and leaving it across the border. While there, they purchased cocaine and marijuana in anticipation of the party Zach was having that night. He invited over all of his friends that his parents didn't approve of and normally would not allow into their home. By the time the welfare check was conducted, Dalen had missed a shift and Brad had missed a shift and a half. News of the murders deeply shocked and saddened co-workers at the prison and officials made counselors available for their staff. Dalen and Brad were considered good parents as well as reliable workers, making the story of their untimely fate even harder to understand. Dalen was remembered as a happy-go-lucky sweetheart who was the sunshine of the graveyard shift. She used to be a bus driver in the relatively small community, so the family was fairly well known throughout town. Bradley Sr. was described as a classical music lover who played many instruments. Zach was remanded into adult custody the next day, having made a full confession. The only iota of a motive gleaned was that he wanted to party and was sick of his parents' rules. He was arraigned December 29th, however his trial didn't begin until August of 2005. He was arraigned December 29th, 2003, however his trial didn't begin until August of 2005. Throughout his six-day-long trial, he was unusually reserved. He remained unmoved and unfazed even as he watched his older brother Bradley Jr.'s emotional testimony. No eye contact was made with any of the family members who consisted mostly of members of Bradley Sr.'s side. The defense team consisted of Michael Politi and Julie McDonald of the Cochise County Legal Defender's Office. Their defense hinged on their declarations that due to a poorly investigated case and a mismanaged crime scene, there was no tangible evidence that Zach was the real killer. Death scene investigator Michael Downing raised serious doubts regarding the integrity of the Eggers crime scene. Downing testified that he found the scene to be profoundly mismanaged. He went so far as to say that, even given Zach's confession, the substandard management of the scene and evidence made it impossible to know, beyond a reasonable doubt, who the real killer was. He pointed out the lack of a command post, meaning that there was no control center set up to help guide investigators or provide an overview of the crime scene. This lent to a lack of overall organization, directly leading to contamination of the property. With only two investigators absolutely necessary, Downing found it ridiculous that he counted seven to eight in total. Downing also pointed out that no one wore shoe covers, leading to a higher possibility of crime scene contamination, not to mention destruction of possible evidence. Not only did he notice no shoe covers, but he noted that at several points during the excavation of the bodies, investigators weren't wearing gloves either. Video of the unearthing of the Eggers' limbs was shown in court. As they were exhumed, Downing pointed out that the victim's hands weren't bagged as per protocol. He didn't approve of the way the confession was handled either. He said that the investigators at the scene should not have been told that Zack had confessed, compelling them to perhaps more thoroughly comb the scene for clues as to the killer's true identity. 
He called it a situation where the Cochise County Sheriff's Department simply did not follow investigative protocol, although they had the means to do so. When Detective Robert Garenser was asked if he had followed procedures wearing gloves and shoe covers, he said that he did not. Zach's former supervisor at the Douglas Wildlife Zoo remembered him to be industrious and hardworking. Gabriel Navarez testified that Zach picked him up from school on Tuesday, after which the pair cruised in his parents' truck going into Sonora, Mexico to buy drugs. He admitted to helping sell the truck there, earning $400 from the proceeds. Navarez said that Zach told him that he was responsible for multiple chores around the property, such as digging holes, and this was one of the reasons he hated his parents. Ursula Ritchie, Cochise County Sheriff's Department investigator, testified that after his confession, Zach not only drew a map of the Eggers' property, but marked the locations of his parents' makeshift graves with dark X's. Pathologist Todd Glauser testified that the Eggers suffered from both perforating and penetrating injuries leading to their deaths. Detective George Hulk testified that the truck was indeed sold in Mexico. He had ultimately contacted Mexican authorities who had found the truck and transported it back to the Douglas Port of Entry. Joshua Eggers, 17, and Michelle Meyer, then 19, who you may recall were Zach's younger brother and cousin, testified for the prosecution as they too resided in the home. Both witnesses testified that it was not normal for the shotgun or brick of marijuana to be located in Zach's bedroom closet. Bradley Jr.'s testimony was emotional and he sobbed when identifying his parents in a photo. War Baby here with a message from StoryWorth. StoryWorth makes it easy and fun for your loved ones to share their stories with weekly emailed story prompts, questions you've never thought to ask. Purchase a subscription for someone you love, and each week, StoryWorth sends them an email with a question about their life. With StoryWorth, you'll receive one year of weekly story prompts and a hardcover printed book, black and white, up to 500 pages. Recipients can write stories and upload photos by email or on the web. Save and edit all your stories on StoryWorth.com. Data is secure and everything is private by default. You control who sees your stories. For $20 off, visit StoryWorth.com slash KillerKids when you subscribe. Fact about me, I'm War Baby because my parents met during the Vietnam War, though obviously my dad gets a story worth gift, as does my brother, our family's second veteran. He had such entertaining stories to tell me way back in the day. Hey bro, I sure hope you can still remember some. StoryWorth is a fantastic way for all the great military stories of my family to be preserved for future generations. Visit StoryWorth.com slash KillerKids for $20 off when you subscribe and prepare to strengthen your family bonds and get to know your loved ones in a whole new way. Let's talk about Poshmark. So yesterday, I received a Los Angeles Chargers navy blue zip-up hoodie for 10 bucks, and I just ordered it four days ago. New NFL gear is pricey, but with Poshmark, I can shop for millions of closets across America. Download the free Poshmark app, follow me by my closet handle, at WarBaby, and get ready to shop tons of brands for the entire family. Listeners of Murderous Miners get $5 off your first purchase with invite code KILLERKIDS when you sign up. Not only can you buy on Poshmark, but you can sell, too. And with super fast shipping, it's easy for everyone. It's like Black Friday every day on Poshmark, with brands like Michael Kors and Tory Burch for a deal. That first vote was 10 for guilty, one for not guilty, and one vote guilty but not a first-degree murder. Marlene then directed the jurors to refer back to the case material. This required a full review of evidence, including the horrible crime scene photos, which were described as graphic and gruesome. The jury also went over what constituted first-degree. Zach had to have foresight or intention that he would cause the deaths. Zach had to have caused the deaths. Zach had to act with premeditation. Finally, they listened to the defense's closing arguments one last time. 
They had contended that it was a true whodunit and that no one could really know who had killed the couple. The evidence against Zach, not including his confession, came mostly from his friends who testified, including Gabriel Navarez's testimony about buying drugs and selling the truck in Mexico. Other friends said that at the party the day after the murders, Zach had told his friends that his parents were out of town. Zach's first girlfriend said that he had told her he wanted to kill his parents. His second girlfriend, who worked with him at the zoo, said he told her he wondered what it would be like to kill someone. Jurors were finally swayed by the fact that an ambush had taken place, deciding that lying in wait was indeed premeditation. He was found guilty on August 24, 2005, and was sentenced on September 28, 2005. At sentencing, Superior Court Judge Stephen Dessen said, You violated two basic tenets of society, Thou shalt not kill, and honor thy father and thy mother. You killed your own parents in cold blood. You shot your mother in the face, and you laid in ambush and shot your father twice. Several people spoke on behalf of Zach at sentencing, like his second girlfriend, Catherine, again, who said this time that he was always nice. She loved him, and she still felt that he was perfect. She acknowledged that he had told her he hated his parents, along with admitting that her own parents didn't support their relationship. She was one of the most favorable witnesses, and he even cracked a smile. Other character statements were given by his former supervisor, Bruno, along with his former Spanish teacher and football and wrestling coaches. He was remembered as quiet and respectful, someone who went out of his way to volunteer. They called him a bright student and an above-average wrestler and football player who had potential. Zach's brother, Bradley Jr., however, said that Zach had a sinister mind and he felt that his brother should spend the rest of his life in prison. Bradley felt that a sentence of natural life in prison was what his brother deserved and what was best for him overall. Bradley Jr. voiced his disappointment that Zach didn't consider that he was robbing Joshua and Michelle of caregivers too, and that he appeared to not care at all where they ended up. Dalen Egger's brother, Don Wetzel, shared similar feelings. He too called for Zach to never enjoy the sunlight from outside of a prison again. The boy's uncle Don also requested a sentence of natural life in prison, pointing out that his nephew had shown absolutely no remorse throughout his trial. Deputy Prosecutor Doyle Johnston, in arguing in support of consecutive life sentences, called Zach cold and calculated and that the gravity of his actions had no effect on him at all. Prosecutor Doyle highlighted an element of certain depravity in the callousness of lying in wait, ambushing your parents individually, cruising in their truck, selling it, and buying drugs with their money, not to mention partying in their house with friends who weren't welcome there, while their bodies lay in the cold ground 30 yards away. He felt it was extremely unlikely that Zack would leave prison less angry and dangerous than he was when he committed the murders. Judge Dessens told Zack that it's difficult for the court to find compassion except for your age. There is no triggering event, no rational, emotional, or psychological reason for your conduct. The judge shook his head dramatically at the lack of a clearly defined motive for the vicious, premeditated attack on his parents. He then sentenced Zachary Samuel Eggers to two life sentences without the chance of parole. Zach received credit for 651 days in the county jail before being transported to Arizona prison complex Iman in Florence. An appeal was immediately filed by Deputy Legal Defender Julie McDonald, although she stressed that she wouldn't be working on that case. It took almost another two years for a decision on the appeal, which was handed down on June 22, 2007. The appeals court ruled that juvenile killers could indeed receive a sentence of life without parole without violating their constitutional rights. Their decision was unanimous and they refused to overturn both his conviction and his life without parole sentences. 
They contended that, at that time, the Eighth Amendment prohibited sentences that were grossly disproportionate to the crime committed, but it didn't.